nice to be here uh, with, with such a formidable crowd here. I'm going to ask uh, Hank, uh, we've got a careful positioning. Uh, Hank, would you like to come and sit there? Carlos here, and Jimmy, you are in the centre, uh, because that's where you are at the moment in this night. Uh, my name is, while they come up, my name is Brian Perry. Uh, I am a professor um, at the University of Oxford in, in tropical veterinary medicine at the medical school uh, and I live in, in Kenya uh, and I used to be at this institute for some 20 years up until seven years ago. So I've got the great pleasure to, uh, to have these three uh, eminent people in front of me. Uh, you, you speak no evil, hear no evil, uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Are you talking about uh, no evil about you? Or, or? <laughs> um, Hank uh, was pro hard talk. Hard talk started under under Carlos's uh, regime, and Crystal w has always given me a hard time about uh, hammering him. Uh, Jimmy has been let off very lightly, but we're, we're going to see what we can do about that. Jimmy, let's start with you. I mean, I I sort of looked you up on. I mean, know you of course for years, but I thought. That. Uh, uh, so my first question is, what did you build on from your predecessor, uh, re regardless of your absence of Wikipedia? What did you build on from Carlos? What was the key thing that Carlos left you? First thing, Brian, is uh, I like your socks very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's no time wasted. You know. <laughs> <laughs> serious penalties. <laughs> Look, um, what have I built on from Carlos? I still have most of his stuff. Um, almost every member of my management team, except one or two, uh, have, Is that been, a good thing? have been Carlos's people. So, I'm, so building, you... I'm building on what he left. Okay. Also, we have to account for, we have to show what the institution have done over time, and many of the things we have to show started on Hank and Carlos, and I'm building on this. Okay, so you, you're not being specific, you're being very general. I'm not being like the World Bank and FAO, where you destroy everything in order to show that you're a good DG. Oh, <laughs> my goodness, my goodness. Off record, huh? Uh, okay, off record. <laughs> Absolutely, the World Bank is still my friend, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and so is FAO, right, Henning? <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. As a former World Bank person, I, uh, I, I, I hope that they're very upset with you. Uh, 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 now, y yesterday, I mean, all I heard was describing problems, uh, but not showing the solutions, let alone not showing what Ilri's contributions are going to be. You know, what are they? And where are they laid out? They've laid out in many impact statements. You didn't do your homework very well, Brian. I, you know, um, I you should have gone wrong and seen all the impact statements, the books that were being put out, all the film clips, all that. Hillary has had impact. Did you listen to the minister's speech? He, he elaborated. Are you just but being facetious, or you really want he, to look for facts? He, the you, minister, you probably wrote his speech, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens with ministers. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Didn't you? No, Did didn't you write his speech? We didn't write this. I didn't write this. Speech. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't know if Ilri wrote this speech, but we, if our communication people did not have a hand in that speech, then they should be sacked. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. You've answered my question, Jimmy. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, so this brings me to the question, are you really in control? I mean, you've got uh, the, the CRPs, these wonderful new creations, uh, are running the show. I mean, Tom Randolph is, is the man in charge. He's the man with the money and, and the direction, isn't he? So what, what is your job? I hire Tom. <laughs> you want me to do everything myself? Is that how you run your show, Brian? I heard that from your staff. Buddy. Okay. The... the, the, the I mean, yesterday at the end, you, you presented a dream. I, mean, I actually quite liked the dream. It was a, um, a little bit of a standing uh, on the mall in Washington, I have a dream type of stuff, which was great. Uh, but it, I'm but the only black DJ around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm allowed to dream, am I not? No, no that's right. <laughs> Well, that was why I brought the power. That's there, are lots of, there are lots of things in common here. That's why, that's why I brought the power lab, because I, but I like it. But what the problem is, Jimmy, is that there is no, you know, we can all dream. Uh, but I 
still don't see, apart from your few impact statements and writing the speech for the minister, I don't see really what the substance is. Uh, I mean, you, you, are you familiar with this? This is something that, uh, uh, this is a white paper, strategic review of livestock in the CGIAR. Um, have you seen this? January 2014, ISPC white paper, yes I have. Um, is there anything in there that... Um, uh, uh, I noticed you sat on it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I just, so, uh, is, are you doing all those things? We progressed since then. January 2014 is a long time ago in terms of the CGIR. Two weeks ago, we released a draft of a strategic results paper. If you haven't read that, you should before you speak with me. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to move over to... Uh, <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to come back. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Uh, Hank, I want to. I want to. Um, I've got something in here, uh, which I. Does Does this ring a bell to you? <laughs> does it? Can you make a comment? No. Can you be with the microphone? Uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was you or Trevor who put that on. Well, actually, uh, it was it was neither. But what uh, when when you came in, if you remember, in the various talks that I used to give, and you arrived from Ilka, uh, with, and you took over as Director General of Ilri, uh, I used to have this figure of Hank Fitzhugh coming coming out at the screen uh, with a with a Superman shirt on and, and calling it Ilka Man. Uh, you don't remember that? Well, fortunately, I was spared from that. But I did know that there was stuff going on down in Nairobi. I wasn't the most welcome person there. Well, I'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just wanted to share this with you. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know whether you re recognize the handwriting of this, uh, but this is uh, Brian. Uh, since Hank won't be needing his shirt in the future, I thought it should be left to you. Uh, don't forget the cape and the lights. Uh, happy holidays, best wishes, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 how kind she was. Um, Hank, um, are you a Twitter man? Are you a Twitter person? Do you go on to no. Twitter? Okay, well, Twitter allows 140 characters. Now, you were never famed for being able to compress anything into 140 characters, but in, 100, in something like that, uh, what, what did you leave behind? What, are the, what is the key thing that you would like to be remembered for uh, as Director General? Hiring me. I, I'll, your turn will come again. <laughs> <laughs> Hank? An institution that was amalgamating two cultures to be better prepared to serve international livestock research. I believe that's, that's what I left behind. How did you, I mean, those were two diverse cultures. Mm. Uh, mm. <laughs> 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 uh, how do, do, you, do you feel you succeeded in uniting them? The first three years were the most difficult years of my life. Uh, when I left in 2001, and Carlos and I actually uh, had a conversation about this, I said there are a couple of really weak points, and I won't won't name them, but basically... You could they, name them if you wanted. No, no, because they have to do with people. They're still here. No, <laughs> no, no, they're not here. But I, what I said was that most of the difficult people with maybe one or two exceptions. We're now gone. What is it when they say present company exemptions? As I think of it, there were two individuals that were still there, all about, both about the same height, neither of which liked each other at all. Okay. And any, anyway, it was an institution that was ready to move ahead. And there was a, a strategy that I believe was accepted within the CGIR for funding. Okay. And, and uh, but, uh, part, part of the, the uh, challenge of, of Ilri ha has always been in capacity building. Is that correct? Uh, sorry, in, in, in building capacity. And I, has Ilri got it right? Because the problem I see is, yesterday we heard in this speech that you wrote, uh, the, uh, the 
how many PhD students, how many master's students, how many people like this. The problem is, it's not students, it's institutions that need to be built, uh, is it not? And how, no. how, how, what is your view about that, and how is it already done in building institutions? No, I, I don't believe that, our, that, the, that an individual center's responsibility is building institutions. I take the lesson from what Lindy said yesterday about her experience. The, one of the principles underlying Becca in that it was going to be a place in which scientists from many different areas, many different areas would come in and they would have a, a place where they could actually build on their knowledge. But that's, an ex that's a very good example of where you could argue that, that it'll be done exactly the opposite. Of, instead of, there are so many national institutes uh, in East Africa, if you wanted to be built in East Africa, uh, why didn't the money go into there? Uh, I as, a, as a result, you built the capacity on the Ilri campus, and poor old uh, Maguga and Kabeti and, uh, uh, and the, down in Tanzania are, are still struggling. That's... I, I take that point, but Brian, I would also have you look back at what the history of the national institutions development, the National Agricultural Research Institutes and so on, have been, particularly here in Africa where there has been a problem of poor governance and poor support for them. Build up the capacity. I think at the risk of uh, bringing things up, Zimbabwe is a good example. The capacity in Zimbabwe in 1990 went down because it didn't get the support. You needed to have an institution like what the CG centers could provide, sort of almost like the Middle Ages, in which the monks preserved it while chaos went on. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to move on. Uh, Carlos, is that right? That uh, we were, uh, Hank took us into the Middle Ages in terms of. <laughs> <laughs> No, well, well, I, can I, well, first of all, if you could just respond to that, and then I'll come, come on to something else. No, I, I think clearly the concept of a beka was that precisely you didn't want to scatter a few resources across the whole continent, but that you wanted to create a capacity <laughs> at one place to do science with a top-notch infrastructure. And I've always argued most of the developments are going to happen through the private sector in terms of new breeds, etc. But these countries need a capacity to understand this science so that the public sector can regulate, engage, and set the rules of the game. And I think that's very much what a place like Becca can do. And that was a better place there uh, at Ilri. You, you, I would you obviously agree that you can't spread the resources, the limited resources which were available. You had to concentrate in one place. And being an international place allowed us to move and share and operate in a way which international programs can't. Okay. Uh, uh, I, when I talked to you three years ago, I, I, I characterized you as the, the politically correct DG. Uh, you were always looking at making sure that things were politically correct. And as a part of this, you were the guardian of the smallholder farmer. Um, and you heard the, all this yesterday about uh, how the smallholder is central to, to Ilri. But we also heard these, these trends. And I, I, I asked you yesterday whether you'd seen uh, Mario Herrero, your, uh, your, your friend, um, uh, his Africa Futures, in which he, uh, he shows that if you rely on the small holder, uh, that Africa is going to be importing enormous amounts, and it's going to be breaking its economies uh, from that. Uh, and he, Afri uh, Mario even said, well, maybe we need large, medium, and large-scale uh, farms. Uh, and th that would be heresy in, uh, in your context, wouldn't it? What is your comment on that? Brian, you helped us write the strategy in 2000 and, and 2002. And keep in mind, we had just approved the Millennium Development Goals. And I think so. we agreed that focusing on poverty was exactly what the world wanted from the international organizations such as ILRI. But that's changed, has it now? I think it has changed, ah. indeed. Yes. I think we focused clearly on poverty. We still came with our CJR baggage, assuming that productivity gains were the way to address poverty. I think over these 15 years, we have learned that there is a whole array of instruments and that productivity 
is one, but it's really a much broader perspective. So these the instruments, well, maybe you should tell Jimmy, because he, he, uh, this emptiness, as I, I've just described, uh, uh, we, we, what, what are the instruments that, uh, that Jimmy should be uh, building on now then? Well, I think clearly when we're talking about poverty, we're not just talking about smallholders, individual smallholders mm -hmm. out there. We're talking a lot more about addressing poverty through employment, poverty through livelihoods for some people by helping, as Jimmy said last night, helping other people move out of the sector and really working with the rural transformation. I think what we've been trying to do is to work against the rural transformation and that's such a powerful force, you will never do that. So we are, I think we've become more realistic in terms of understanding that the interplay between social policies and agricultural technology and things like that addresses a whole array of livelihood pathways. Well, I, when, I, one. when I, when I, three years ago again, in the presence of both of you, I, I interviewed you, and, uh, and when I mentioned this thing about poverty through livestock, Jim, you, Jimmy, you said, oh, you've been reading too much Paul Collier with your, with your yes. comment, which I, uh, I, and Paul Collier is a, uh, it, it thinks about poverty and thinks about all sorts of tools. Uh, uh, Carlos brought up this, this business about the Millennium Development Goals. Look, we've now got the Strategic Development Goals, or they are emerging. They're sustainable. Sustainable, sustainable, sustainable Development Goals, I beg your pardon. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I've got so many bits of writing there. Um, that, uh, there are now 17 of these, Jimmy. Here, you've got uh, these four areas that you had everybody go through uh, yesterday. FAO's got its three or four areas. I mean, I, isn't it bizarre that you're trying to create your own little... Why don't you stick to the, the sustainable development goals? Why don't you use them as the framework? Because livestock is, is relevant to all of them. I see you've even given a talk on that. Yes, and it... it to address them, it doesn't mean you need to fold yourself into them completely. You map yourself to those goals, and we have mapped ourselves, and have we you? mapped to most of them. Have you? We just said I spoke about them. I must have done so. I usually but, think about but what that I was say. A, that was a PowerPoint presentation that uh, somebody prepared for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I get a lot of help, Brian. <laughs> I, 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 I have to admit that, and I have good help. Yes. Just look around the people I have around me. So you don't, but now, but. Yesterday, we heard, for example, uh, a comment saying, well, this should be addressed through the climate change gender group, and this should be addressed through uh, some uh, other group, a livestock group. Surely, everyone coming in and focusing on what their contributions are to SDGs, which is on human well-being, is going to be much more useful, bringing people together. Well, I mean, yeah, you can't have everybody... Have, uh, as far as you're concerned, all of Ilri should be one unit. You can't manage that way. You put things in relation to how they function. And so you manage in these functional groups. That doesn't mean they don't relate to each other. They relate to each other. And so the CGIAR has picked three things, not four things anymore. Um, poverty, food security, and nutritional security. And, and natural resource management. Those are the three things. And if you look at those three things, they map to many of the sustainable development goals. Tell me, but, but one, one thing is, though, that ILRI has got its, uh, its strategy. Um, we were a bit critical about it in this, uh, in this white paper. Uh, and we also said that should ILRI's strategy be the CG-wide livestock re uh, research strategy? What is your comment about that? No, ILRI, uh, ILRI's strategy is informing the CGIR strategy as well as driving the agenda. But there isn't but a CGIR uh, livestock strategy. Well, there's not a livestock strategy, Should but the CGIR strategy that uh, sets things at a very high level, and, and livestock is a part of that. Livestock is a part of the poverty agenda, it's part of the food and nutritional security agenda, and it's part of the environment. You don't need to extract it uh, uniquely from that. What we need is things to work together and relate to each other, not separate them. But I, we'll, I'll come back to that. Hank, uh, w w li listening to uh, this eloquent, eloquent uh, prose here, well, what would you have done differently if you were in Jimmy's shoes today? And very nice shoes they are too, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what All I'm missing is a sock. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, what would you, because you, the environment has changed, uh, the, the CG has changed its mode of operation. Have you any thoughts on 
on what you could have brought to that type, those type of pressures? Well, my, my thoughts really spin off of what Jimmy said. The livestock strategy for the CGIR is that the development of livestock fits within the overall agriculture. If you try and pull livestock out as a separate commodity, a separate entity, and just deal with it, you're not going to be successful. In fact, one of the problems of the 70s and 80s with both Ilka and Ilred is that they did that. They said, we are the livestock centers. It's sort of like saying, Simit, we are the wheat center. Instead of focusing on the fact that Accarta and others were dealing with wheat as well. So what's important, and I, I would build on the question that you said, the ILRI strategy, and I think it does by looking at the CRPs, should also be thinking, should be built into that, is what are the CRPs going to do? and not only the one that John's leading and Tom's leading, but also what's going on in the Carta and what's going on in the other centers. Well, we were quite critical in this white paper because we felt that, uh, that the, there wasn't enough integration. Uh, and, for example, many of the feed centers are, uh, are not looking at the, at the feed for livestock types of, uh, types of issues. How, do you, how yeah. do you make that happen within the city? Well, Brian, they're doing more of that now. The whole purpose of the system-wide livestock program, which I would say is inform the development of the CRPs, yes. is that success was going to come from looking at food feed. And that meant you brought in semits, you brought in all of the crop centers, and, and got them built in. And an awful lot of effort, Salvador, Jimmy, all of these put a lot of effort in making sure that the resources human capabilities, institutional resources of those centers with their partners in the national programs fit into the SLP. And I actually think that the SLP was very successful. It, it was terribly underfunded. So it's one of the things that you look back on under your, in your era very, very positively. Uh, Hank, you are now with Bioversity. Uh, Carlos, uh, sorry. <laughs> he, he's taller than that. <laughs> we both have white hair. <laughs> Carlos, you're with Bioversity uh, now. Uh, this re all sorts of uh, interesting questions come in the livestock, uh, animal genetic resources issues uh, in livestock. I don't know whether you're directly involved. So here we've got uh, Paul Collier, uh, not Paul Collier, we've got um, uh, others in the sustainable uh, intensification program calling for... Uh, these various activities, including getting the right genotype, and there's been this dramatic narrowing uh, of, of ge genetic resources uh, as a result of the intensification process. What, does, what, what is your view about that? How do one get this balance between retaining uh, indigenous gen uh, genetic resources in livestock, but at the same time moving this sustainable intensification process forward? Well, I think the key to it is the fact that the diversity of the environments in which you will have to produce food. This is the big difference with the Green Revolution of the 60s, where you had a very homogeneous environment. You had one package, IR8, 100 kilos of nitrogen, etc., and that was broadly applied and was quite successful. That was the easy game. The reality now is you've got to produce in a lot more marginal locations, more diverse environments under rain-fed conditions, and that absolutely requires a lot more diversity in what you're going to do. So I think the sustainable intensification principles are going to help us think through that, but you will have to tap into those genetic resources to adapt it. And the whole argument, I guess, Steve Kemp and others make is, with these powerful instruments we have now in genomics, et cetera, we're going to be able to customize those materials a lot more. Okay. So we will have a, a range across large spaces, but Obviously, we'll specialize in, in individual niches. Okay, and that and that uh, key, um, that one that was yesterday was uh, extremely interesting. But uh, Jimmy, uh, in the in the Ilry strategy and the um, we wrote when we did this white paper, we said that the uh, genetics component was more of a shopping list than uh, than a, than a plan and a, and a program. Um, what do you say about that? You jump to conclusions. 
<laughs> well, you didn't understand what we were trying to do. We were thinking through, consulting with partners, looking at where the science is going, and evolving our thinking you about what we should do. We presented to you yesterday our plan. You shouldn't make the same. I don't think you can make the same judgment about this plan as you was when you were writing your white paper. But Brian, I know a characteristic <laughs> of you why you're a good scientist and and all that. You like to find the critical things. You like the juicy parts <laughs> of the discussion. Uh, uh, well, uh, that was um, that was a. I mean, that that's the reason why you're director general, Jimmy. <laughs> you give. Uh, uh, you've got that great ability to give those wonderful uh, those wonderful smooth answers uh, that don't answer the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> In uh, the way you would like me to, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh, um, what I, I, I've just been given a, um, a a sign about time, um, communication with uh, with others. Uh, there is this very interesting initiative that the uh, that the Global Agenda for Sustainable Livestock. Uh, um, I think Henning I I is around here has been very much part of that, and that has been. Uh, very, very successful in bringing a wide group of stakeholders together. Is this something that you think is useful, or is it just a, a detraction and a, and a waste of time, Jimmy? Henin can tell you that I chaired the process of starting that agenda until I became DG, where I felt that it, I, I couldn't, one, afford the time, and two, um, I couldn't prejudice the agenda. I was only interested in research. But I, I was the chair of that group um, with FAO as the secretariat, um, for the four, six, or eight meetings um, when I was in the World Bank. Um, so it's something You're I support. believe in. I'm a, a supporter, and Shirley has continued to participate, and other staff members have continued to participate. It's had a great success in terms of raising awareness within the commercial sectors, in, uh, the JBS, the Nestles, the McDonald's, etc., who have really taken on this issue of greenhouse gases and, and livestock production. How on earth are you going to bring that type of capacity to respond to, uh, to, to Africa and, and, and Asia? Well, I don't know how Nestle and others would respond. That's their interest. We are in the tent. It's a big tent. We created a big tent for these relational um, aspects that we talked to. You can't isolate the solutions of livestock from everything else. So we created this big tent where we can uh, try to look at what are the issues, what are the priorities, and so on. And it's for us, the issues are what, are what are the researchable issues that we can reasonably contribute to. Um, I don't know how Nestle and McDonald's and all the rest of them would do that. Only if we are only interested in that from the standpoint of what sort of uh, products they will be sourcing and how can we provide the products that they want to source. My last question uh, to, uh, to all of you, uh, is Hillary too DG centric is it? Or is this ha has this hierarchy? Should you have a, a junta? Uh, should you have a, a, a politburo or or somewhere where you've got a diversity of uh, uh, of opinions? Are we putting too much into the the, 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 the hands of of one individual in, in running this uh, this livestock program? I just told you I had a lot of help. They write powerpoints <laughs> and, and so on, so we get a lot of help. No, um, <coughs> no, is I don't know if it is DG-centric. I thought so when I first came to Ilri. Um, people like to, to hear the DG speak. I remember going to a fire alarm one day soon after I arrived, and everybody had gathered in this zone where you're supposed to gather in the case of a fire alarm. And at the end of the drill, it was a drill, at the end of the drill, they asked me to say something. <laughs> well, I didn't know what I needed <laughs> to say about a fire alarm. Ca ca it, uh, it was Martin who was supposed to. Carlos uh, and Hank, do you have a uh, last comment on that? Well, I think you need uh, a capacity to engage more widely. And I think one of the challenges we've had is that we've been very self referential. And I think we tried in Ilri to be much more open. And I think the management team. Uh, the way we were operating when I was here was very much engaging everybody around the table. And I think we need even a lot more external input into the system. Hank, you have the last word. Well, you've, you've heard what, how Ilri has evolved. Brian, what you're thinking about are the DGs of the 80s, exactly. the, the emperors and the king. 
that changed. I would like. Am I not? <laughs> <laughs> I would. I would like to think that there was some of those changes became apparent during the 90s, and I'm really impressed, positively impressed, by the changes that came on. Uh, one one example that I've noted, and I think some of you would verify that. I was always referred to by my first name. Now, a lot of people kept trying to push it. It was going to be doctor this, doctor that. Carlos, you came in, and you really got that done. Everything now is on a first name. You don't identify the DG up on a podium or whatever. Okay. Uh, great, very good. Uh, with, that, with that, thank you all very much indeed. Uh, uh, in the land of former Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much to Emperor <laughs> Jimmy Smith, to Carlos. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>